Hello, Global Gardeners. Welcome to another Gardening Monday here on Your Gardening Week Live. Great to see everybody checking in. Today, we're going to spend 90 minutes answering your questions, all those things that you've been wondering about that maybe I didn't have time for. I'm going to be focusing, trying to get to as many questions as possible today, and we'll see where that leads us. Jawala Prasad, thank you so much for starting the day with a nice super chat. Happy holidays back to you. I learned and still learning a lot from me. Thanks a million. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's a great start to the Monday, and it's nice to have you here. And let's see what else we can learn as we proceed through the day. The very first question actually came from Mage Grey Wolf today. And thank you, Jay, for answering the question. But it's where can you send me photos or ask questions or any anything that you want to correspond about? And it's at Gardner Scott at GardnerScott.com. So if you want to send me a background photo, that's the address to send it to. Do make it in landscape mode, as large a file as you can do, and then do give me permission to use it, and I'll add it to the queue. The queue is pretty empty right now. I do have a number of photos that have been sent, but they're either not in landscape mode, or the file isn't large enough to actually look good on the screen, or I didn't get permission. So that's why we're doing things like showing you my garden, and I'll talk about this picture of my garden here in a little bit as we move forward. Uh, there also a uh, question came up that uh, Jay was answering as well. Uh, the, the question was about filling a pot with something like aluminum cans. So if you have a big pot and you're gonna grow something in it, what do you do with the bottom part? And so I agree with Jay. I prefer to fill pots with yard waste, uh, or sticks, something organic. The idea, you, you'll see this on, on some suggestions where you take those uh, packing peanuts from shipping boxes and put those in the bottom of pots or aluminum cans, some non-organic material. I prefer to use organic material, just like Jay is suggesting, something that will break down over time. And if you have a big enough pot that you're trying to fill with something, eventually you're going to get some really good soil organisms in there. So why not fill the bottom with organic material? I understand the weight issue, and that's why you would use aluminum cans or the packing peanuts. But put the pot in place empty and then fill it with some of that organic matter. Then put your potting soil in and you won't have to worry about carrying a heavy pot around. I, 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 I think that's more beneficial for the, the soil and the plants that will be growing. And believe it or not, if, and even if you add something like crushed gravel or rock to the bottom of pots, that doesn't improve drainage like a lot of people think. The way water works is it, it takes a lot of energy basically to move from one medium to another. So in the soil that's resting on top of some of that foreign material, the water will drain down through the soil. Then when it hits that foreign material at that lower level, it stops draining. And so you can actually have a pretty wet, saturated soil when you're trying to improve drainage by putting some of those foreign materials down below. So I think staying organic is a great way to do it. Uh, let's see what we have. If you have any questions, by all means, throw everything at you. Nice to see you today, Jean-Pierre. It's five o'clock in the evening in Belgium. And so I'm glad you can join us since your Monday is mostly over. Nice to see a lot of other people checking in. Frank says, I was thinking about the disease that ruined my tomato starts last year. Is it possible that seeds could carry disease? I had some that came from Germany that showed disease first. Yes, it is possible. And it, it, in fact, it's one of those things. I was just doing some, some reading recently that was just fascinating. As that the seed can actually carry on and in it some of the beneficial bacteria and some of the starts to what that plant needs from a bacterial perspective. And so uh, it can also carry uh, fungal spores and it can carry uh, diseases. And so 
that's where it comes to buying your seed from a reputable source and a source that you trust is that you have to trust the seed producer that the seed is clean. But if the fruit was contaminated from a contaminated plant, it is possible that the seed could be contaminated as well. We don't typically see that in most of the big seed producers, at least I haven't seen it here in the States, uh, but it's definitely a possibility if you're sharing seeds or even if you were to get seeds from another country and, and nothing against Germany, of course, but there is that possibility if someone just saved seeds and sent them to you that it could come from a diseased plant. Uh, and so that's that's good to know. It's one of those, it depends on the disease, of course, but there uh, is the chance that you can save seed from a diseased plant, but just like avoiding the, the diseases in your compost pile, anytime you have a diseased plant or diseased fruit, it's best to just throw it away so that you no longer have that kind of issue in your garden. And then hopefully you can clean it out from your soil. Uh, Enialis is saying, Scott, my question is about bag soil. I use new soil for my garden in the spring. Do I need to replace the soil with new soil this spring? And so uh, this is a good question, actually. So if it's actual soil, soil meaning that it's got uh, all the mineral components to it, it it's, it's what most people would call dirt. If it's soil, then you don't need to replace it. Just amend it. Just add more organic matter to that particular bed. If it's what commonly is sold in, in nurseries and home centers and the garden centers as garden soil, and you look at the ingredients on the back, if the ingredients on the back actually don't contain any soil, if it's all organic material like like compost and decomposed forest products and cocoa core and peat and all those other things that are typically in these bags that are labeled as soil, then yes, you'll probably need to add some more nutrients to the soil, add more organic matter. And I would suggest adding your own soil, your own native soil that you can dig out of the ground, mix it with all of that that garden soil and and read the bag because a lot of those bags the especially the big name brands they'll tell you all of the ingredients and then somewhere in the back of the bag it will say this product should be mixed with garden soil at a rate of two to one or three to one depending on how much organic matter is in that bag and so too often you read the bag that says garden soil, you assume that means that you can just put your plants in it, but it's only the organic matter that's in that soil. There really aren't the minerals that the plants need. You don't have the soil structure that comes about by adding your own native soil, and you need to replenish those nutrients that have either leached out or have been used up by the plants. So uh, take a look at the bags just so you know for sure and mix most of those bagged products with your own soil for the best results. And hopefully things will work out the way that you're hoping from. Renato is saying, I'm redoing my garden, not much growing. Next year, I'll be sending some pictures. And so go ahead and send pictures. This is a picture from my garden today. It's, it's not pretty by green garden standards, but I'd love to see what all of your gardens are looking like over the course of the winter. And for those of you that are watching or watching on replay from the Southern Hemisphere, I'd really love to see your garden right now in as we approach summer so that we can have some of that as a backdrop on our cold and snowy days that some of us are about to be getting uh, sooner, than I think, rather than later. Though we don't have snow here yet. The Every day here in Colorado Springs, we set a new record for the latest first snowfall. We haven't had any precipitation since August, effectively. And so we just keep waiting for that snow. We'll, we'll see if we can actually uh, get it. But keep your, keep your fingers crossed, at least for some of us. And, and it would be nice to have some precipit precipitation in my garden. 
Uh, okay, Mayday Garden says, there's a wood chipper right outside my door getting rid of a dead tree. Wow, I'm so tempted to run over there with a trash bag and ask for chips. Do it. Absolutely do it. In fact, if, if you want more than just a bag, talk to them and they probably would be willing to dump the truckload in your driveway or wherever you want it. I know a lot of people that have done that and it, it's a great option great option to get free wood chips so by all means go over there with a bag and get a, a small amount but don't be afraid to ask for more because in most cases the tree services that are chipping up trees have to take that truckload to a landfill and pay to dump it and they got to drive all the way to that location to dump it if you ask them to dump it in your yard many many times They'll be more than happy to do that because it saves them money and it saves them a trip to the spot that they have to. So um, get out there, meet some someone new, and you may have a great source of wood chips in the future. Okay, let's see what we have. A lot of good talking going back and forth about the packing peanuts. And yes, there are some that are bio biodegradable. A lot of it depends on, on where they come from and what they're used for. Uh, but I, I prefer the actual organic material like wood chips and sticks and branches and stuff like that in my pots. Joy of the Garden, good morning. I have a lot of wood ash coming in. Where should I spread them for future planting plans? And so I have a video where I talk about some of the dangers of wood ash. Wood ash for centuries around the world has been a great soil amendment. It adds potassium when it's worked into the soil. In fact, that's potash is where we, we get that whole potassium in our language. And it can work, but it has an alkaline pH. And so in most areas that historically have great crops, the soil is acidic. And so when you add all of that wood ash, it, it buffers in the soil, it doesn't really affect the pH, it raises it slightly above the acidic level, and it can be a great amendment. But if you live in an area that has alkaline soil, by spreading wood ash on your soil, you can actually increase the pH high enough so it's outside the preferred range of plants, and your plants can actually suffer not because that you're adding potassium, but because you're raising the soil pH. So anytime before you add wood ash, please get a soil test done so you know what your pH is. If you have an acidic soil or a low neutral soil, by all means, you can add wood ash. I think a, a, a good way to add wood ash to your garden is to add wood ash to your compost pile. Because as we've talked in recent weeks, potassium does not travel through the soil very well. It, it's, it doesn't leach out as quickly as something like nitrogen. So you really want to work it into your soil. If you're making compost, chances are you're working the compost into the soil. And if there's wood ash in your compost, it's getting worked into the soil. And so that would be my preferred method. You can spread it across the surface and then put mulch on top of it, and it will have some good effect, assuming that your soil pH can support that. Uh, but one of the big issues with, with wood ash is you don't know for sure how much to use, especially if you've got a lot. And so you really can get into a situation where you're introducing too much potassium to your soil, and that can actually lock out other nutrients. Almost any nutrient, if it's in abundance uh, too much, it will block other nutrients from getting into the plant. And so plants will suffer if there's too much phosphorus, too much potassium, too much calcium, too much of almost anything. So the key is to try to find a balance. Uh, I would start uh, assuming all the conditions are right with just a light sprinkling of wood ash. See if you notice any um, difference and then you can increase it gradually but I, uh, I I really would be careful about using too much of it and that way you would uh, hopefully resist some of those issues where uh, you lock out the nutrients because you have too much potassium in your soil okay 
uh, Isabella, good morning to you from sunny New York. It's sunny here. We actually have a pretty warm day ahead of us uh, with lots of wind coming. Bettina says windy eastern Ontario. The, the middle of the United States was hit by some devastating tornadoes uh, this last week. I hope everyone is okay and everyone you know is okay. We have some really high winds that are coming here in the next couple of days. So uh, we've got some unusually warm conditions in the south and then the typical cold conditions in the north. And that's just joining those cold fronts and and warm fronts together and creating some huge wind events. So I hope your garden survive and everything is well moving forward through the, the rest of this week. Okay, let's see what we have popping up here. As I scroll down, Ed is saying no snow in Manchester yet. Did have a one inch fall last week, but it's gone by the end of the day. Yeah, a lot, a lot less snow in a lot of other areas. Of course, here in Colorado, that could mean that come January or February, we just get inundated. I've seen years like that before, but we'll just have to wait and see. If you hear noises in the background, that's Mala down there. She's chewing on her bones and who knows what else she's doing, but she's right next to me and making lots of background noise today. Uh, so bear with me if it's too noisy in the background. Mala just wants to join us and... Uh, that's okay. She's got free ro roam of the area. Uh, Jay Dixon, there's the uh, video that she's right on top of understanding wood ash in the garden. I don't use wood ash because my soil, uh, my soil here is on the um, in the neutral range, but on the high side of neutral, 7.0. And so I really don't want to raise my pH out of that range that the plants really like. And so I'm not using wood ash in the garden. And I like biochar. Biochar can also raise the pH level a lot. So I like to use biochar in my garden, but just one application. And it tends to buffer a little bit in time. The soil buffers everything. If you're adding organic matter to your soil and you have an alkaline soil, well, all that organic matter will bring the pH closer to neutral. And if you have an acidic soil and you add a lot of organic matter, it'll tend to bring the pH closer to neutral. So yeah, another reason to amend a lot, but adding something like uh, wood ash, uh, at least for me, I'm right on the edge. And it's one of those things that uh, I don't really want to change the soil pH any higher. James, good morning to you from Kansas City, Missouri. Connie is saying, I'm trying to grow two loquat trees. They keep getting aphids on the new leaves. I've washed them off, pulled off leaves. They keep coming back, help. And so this is one of those situations, you spray them off, absolutely. But I, I would try not to get rid of all of them. I talked about this in a video at the beginning of the year where I, I had some of my bushes, one bush in particular, in particular that was just overloaded with aphids. And I cleaned off some of the aphids, but I left a large number of aphids. And then the ladybugs came by the dozens to eat all of those aphids. And for the rest of the summer, the rest of the growing season, I didn't have any problem with aphids in my garden because early in the year, those aphids had attracted the predators that stayed in my garden for the rest of the season. And so, that's that's one option is to allow some aphids to remain so that the predators will come and take care of those aphids the the trees any plant that's that's being eaten by a pest will send out chemical signals that will actually attract some of those predators and you, you kind of have to let nature take its course there's a delay usually the aphids hit first and then the beneficial insects come in after that to help promote that, and it's a little bit late possibly for you, Connie, but grow as many flowers and as many herbs as you can throughout your landscape. Give those beneficial insects a home to overwinter, to raise their young, and they'll be in place as soon as the aphids show up. But as far as dealing with the aphids, sure, you could try to to spray with neem oil and, and do a lot of those kind of things, but particularly 
on a tree, it becomes more difficult dealing with the aphids. Also look at your watering practices, how you're taking care of the tree, because insect pests tend to attack the plants that are unhealthy, or at least not at full health. And so if, the, if you have an infestation on the tree, it may be saying that the tree is not as strong as you would like it to be. And it could be that you're overwatering or underwatering. You might need to add some nutrients to your soil. So look at the whole picture to try to figure out why the aphids are there in the first place, but then try to get nature to, to help you out. It really can be one of those things that, that uh, can work out for you in the long run with a lot of your other plants as well. Pedro says, do you have any experience on collecting rainwater? Uh, I do from a, probably a different perspective than you would imagine until I think it's four years now, maybe just three years ago, three or four years ago, the laws changed here in the state of Colorado. Before that point, it was illegal in the state of Colorado to collect rainwater because all, most of our water either flows on the west side of the Rocky Mountains all the way to the ocean or on the east side of the Rockies all the way to the ocean into some major rivers like the Colorado River on the west side. And so farmers and cities that are along those major waterways own that water. And so even though it might snow or rain in the mountains of Colorado, that water that flows into the rivers is owned by somebody downstream. And so it was illegal for us to collect rainwater. So yes, I do have experience on collecting rainwater just because I learned the laws involved in my state that said I can't do it. Well, about three or four years ago, the laws changed and now we can actually have two rain barrels per home that we can collect our, our water. And it's one of those things that I, I advocate collecting your own water. Just be aware of where the water's coming from. Take a look at your roof, the makeup of the material on your roof, and be aware that particularly if you have an old asphalt shingle roof, a lot of the, the, that material is being washed off the roof and now into the rainwater. And all the birds and the squirrels and everything else that are on the roof that are pooping, all their droppings are coming down into your rainwater. And so it is something that's great to save and then use in the garden. Just be aware that there might be some pathogens and some harmful materials that might be in that rainwater. And so uh, I, I know this might sound a little bit um, different than what a lot of others advocate. Uh, if you have some of those issues with old roofs and a lot of animals on the roofs, it might not be the kind of water you would want to use on your edible vegetable garden area. Don't pour that water on top of the spinach and the lettuce and then harvest and take it into the kitchen. Make sure you're applying it directly to the soil, not to the plants. And then once it works into the soil, it should be okay. Or water areas of your garden that are not the edibles and, and you should be fine. Uh, Renato's working on a hoop house greenhouse. Awesome, I think that's great. Uh, I, I am still working on the inside of my greenhouse right here. And you'll be seeing more of that as I continue the inside construction. But I know your excitement. That is one of those things that is uh, wonderful to be moving forward to when you can have your your own warm space to be growing in. Uh, Rach J6 saying hi from Massachusetts. I'm wondering when should I begin thinking of my water system? Is there a system you recommend? Um, good question. And so I think you should be starting about your thinking of your water system right now. Uh, if you're asking the question, then the time is right. And it, it depends on how you like to water and what plants you are growing. And so I love to hand water. I think it is one of those things that can get you up close and personal with your plants. You can see insect pests as they appear, so you could deal with them right away. You can see potential diseases as they appear. And so you're, you're on top of things in your garden because you're hand watering the garden. Plants have different levels of water needs. And so hand watering also allows you to 
vary how much water you give to each bed and to each plant. So I just love getting out of my garden and spending the time and doing the watering. If you want a more automatic system, I like soaker hoses. Soaker hoses that you put directly on the soil and you're watering the soil. We don't need to water plants. We need to water soil. And then the moist soil will support the plants. Soaker hoses are a great, great way to do that because it tends to put water over a, a, a broader area in that bed. And I think it's important to continue to improve your soil by promoting the soil life, which means your whole bed should have moist soil in it. Drip irrigation is okay, and I'll actually be doing some videos on drip irrigation here in the springtime to get water to individual plants, and that's great. An issue, depending on where you live, I live in a very dry area, is that you might need extra emit emitters to get the water throughout the entire bed or else you've got dry soil everywhere except right around the plant and so you're really not benefiting the soil life in your bed you're only benefiting the soil life directly around your plants and so definitely a way to just turn a valve and get the the water to each of your plants and as long as you've got the right emitter for the right type of plant everything will be fine I'm sorry, I have to take a break because my dog is tearing up things behind me. But anyway, th so think about how you like to water and that will really influence the, the, the choice of the watering system that, that you use. I'm not a big advocate of overhead watering like a big sprinkler system because that's, especially in an area like mine where we're not getting precipitation and we don't have the water you're watering pathways and you're watering areas that really don't need as much water. So all those are considerations. And yes, now is the time you should start thinking about some of those things so that when you get the, the plants in the ground and after you've amended and after you've dealt with all those kind of things, as far as the soil is concerned, your water is right behind and ready to go. So excuse me for just a second as I deal with my dog, who is really active today for some reason. So let's get back on to some of the other stuff. We're going to answer some questions about, let's see, uh, Egocentric Homestead says, I don't see many ladybugs in my garden, but there's definitely something out there that eats aphids. I put a plant loaded with aphids outside in two days, not an aphid left. Lace wings are a great plant for or a great insect that eats a lot of the, the aphids. And there are actually a lot of wasps that are teeny tiny wasps that will eat aphids. And so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. Go on. I love having my new garden dog, but she's got so much energy sometimes. Okay. Let's see what else we have going on here. If you have a question for me, it helps to put at Gardener Scott at the beginning of it. And that way I can see what uh, what you're asking. And that, as Jay is saying to egocentric uh, or echocentric homestead, I, I do think there is that balance of the pest problems. Uh, like, you know, just what we're talking about. You may not see ladybugs, but suddenly all the aphids appear. And so, I've, I've, it's been a while since I've talked about this, but you can buy a lot of these predators. And if you haven't bought a bag of ladybugs, it's a lot of fun, especially if you got kids. Buy a bag of ladybugs and release them in your garden because it's a great lesson in learning how to waste your money. Because you buy a bag of ladybugs, you release it in your garden, and all those ladybugs fly away to someone else's garden. And so I think having learned that lesson, that it really is more important to build your own environment that encourages ladybugs that might be flying from someone else's garden to land in your garden and take care of all of your pests. But it's a lot more than just ladybugs. There are so many other amazing creatures out there that can actually help you in your garden that you don't even know about. 
and it, it's it's creating that balanced system and they'll find you and they'll actually help you out without you even knowing who they are and where they are you just recognize that your problems have gone away because you created a nice healthy environment from the soil all the way up into the plants and the mulches and everything else you use okay let's see what else we have going on be sure and throw your questions. The whole idea today is to try to get the questions answered. So throw your questions at me. Rafael is saying, are you planning to winter so? And if so, when will you start? Um, so I've actually already started some winter sowing. Now I'm not doing it in all of it. I'll be doing some in the gallon jugs like I showed uh, in a video this last year. Uh, but a lot of it is I'm doing open sowing. I've already done it with some of the seed bombs that I created. So I made some some seed balls using uh, native plant seeds and perennial seeds. And I've been spreading those those seed balls around my garden now for a couple months. Uh, I'll also probably through January when as I'm going through my seeds and buying new seeds and and I've already identified some of the older seeds like the flower seeds. I'll just be spreading those throughout my garden as well. Uh, most of those perennial plants and native plants do need the cold weather. They need that vernalization, the cold stratification of the seed to be able to germinate. And so for me, November, December, January are great times to be getting that seed out because some of those seeds do need a couple months of cold temperatures before they'll germinate best in spring. And so uh, I think I mentioned this maybe last week or the week before where I'll put seeds on top of snow. And then as the snow melts, it carries that seed down into the mulch and onto the soil. And, and that can be a pretty effective way to get some of those seeds um, spread throughout the garden. Okay, Sunset Hosta Farm is asking, is it true that aphids are attracted to areas that have high amounts of nitrogen. Yes, there is some truth to that. And so um, this is another reason why, particularly in the middle of the growing season, you might wanna limit your nitrogen fertilizers. When you, when you have a lot of, of, of nitrogen in your soil, and usually as a result of a fertilizer, it promotes new green growth. And so a lot of that new young green growth is an ideal food for the aphids and a lot of the caterpillars, a lot of those garden pests you have. And so it's not necessarily that the nitrogen is attracting those pests, it's that the nitrogen is promoting that, that new growth on those plants and off, often at, at the expense of the plant. The plant is ready to set flower and set fruit and instead you're, you're forcing it to, to grow new green leaves and new sprouts. And that can be enough to actually stress the plant, potentially send out some of those, those chemicals that, that aphids highlight on and they'll be, they'll be drawn to the plant and start eating it. So um, a, a balance of fertilizer is always a good idea. Healthy soil should mean that you don't have to use a, a lot of those those fertilizers but look for that if if you've just done a recent fertilization and you notice a whole bunch of new young green growth don't be surprised if the aphids and the caterpillars uh, soon show up afterwards yet another reason to try to already have that population of lace wings and ladybugs and all those other wonderful predators in place before they they uh, show up but the key is high nitrogen yes a high amount of fertilizer and excess really can pose some of those problems okay let's see uh what else we have rolling on rudimentary garden hello to you from dallas texas severin is saying no need to apologize about the dogs being dogs we like to see them before you know i, I always spend some time getting everything ready to go before I start on Mondays and she was jumping up on back of this chair. And so I was expecting that she was probably going to do that and you were going to get to see a firsthand view of Mala in the garden. So, or in, in, on the show today. So, uh, 
she's left the room momentarily. We will see if she returns. So Anna Dennis saying, I was gifted some berry bushes and boxes a few months back, but it was too late to plant them. I still have them. They're dry now. Should I keep them and try in spring or put them up? So um, I would say, uh, and I think you mean pot them up or put them up. And, and so you have a couple different options. So when, when I get plants too early or too late, I prefer to, to put them in a pot and put them in a secluded area. And then in spring, they're all ready to go. I can start watering them. I can harden them off. I can put them outside. You have to be careful uh, with a plant that's like in a box. If it's a bare root or if it isn't fully developed and it dries out, then those roots can desiccate and that'll kill the plant. And so you, you save it in the condition that it's in in the box. And then you go to plant in spring and the plant is dead. <clears throat> so depending on where you have the plant, it should be a nice cool location. Uh, below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius is a nice target. And if you can get it down into that 40 degree Fahrenheit or about four and a half degrees Celsius, that's even better. That'll keep the plant dormant until it's ready to put outside. But if you pot it up or put it up into some good soil that you can keep moist, you don't want it to be wet because that can actually lead to potential rot of the roots and then just leave it in a, in a nice protected environment until it can go outside. If it's it, most berry bushes can handle cold freezing conditions. So you don't need to necessarily put it in your house in a warm area because that can cause it to begin uh, breaking dormancy and sprouting. And if it's not ready to go outside, now you've got a berry bush growing in your house and you're not ready for that. So that's why you want to keep it in a cool location so that it stays dormant. But yeah, I would say definitely keep them and try putting them out in spring. Uh, worst case scenario, they don't make it, but you might be lucky enough and, and you have those berry bushes ready to go. Okay, let's see what we have. Lama Lama saying, I live in a dry part of Northern California and this fall I amended with vermiculite in hopes it will help with water retention. And so vermiculite is primarily used uh, to improve soil drainage, but it does have some water retention ability. Not a lot. A better way to retain soil water or, or soil moisture is to use compost and organic matter in your soil. That will act like little sponges and it's a much better way to retain the, the soil moisture. So vermiculite, a little bit. It's really not a primary way to retain water. Get some organics in there and that'll be a much better way to, to do it. Okay, yeah, Mal is just like having a kid again, definitely. So <laughs> she, she, so it's it's a little crazy. So I actually had, oh, are you gonna jump up? There she is. So I had her spayed this last week and so she's got the cone on her head. And what that means is that that has limited a lot of her activity. And normally when I'm doing this show, I'll have the dog door open and she can run in and out and have a lot of that freedom. But because her, her freedom is limited right now, she is hanging around. So there you were, she, it is just like having a kid again and we'll be getting her outside hopefully here in the not too distant future once we finish this up. Okay, let's see, Lila's saying, does a winter garden in very cold temperatures continue to grow or just maintain its growth? And so um, if you haven't seen the, the video I did a little over a week ago about the Persephone period. So in the Northern hemisphere in the winter, this time of year, there's very little sun and it's not enough sun to promote new growth on plants. And depending on the plant, it may or may not be enough to sustain the plant. And so if you're winter growing in a greenhouse where it's warm enough for the plant, there might not be enough light for that plant. And so you have to look at those balance of, uh, of factors. And so if it's a kind of plant that, that 
can survive the temperatures you're growing at, then it's probably just going to sustain its, its life at this point. Don't anticipate any new growth. In fact, what's probably going to happen because of the lack of light, you're going to see leaves falling off most plants that we're attempting to grow in the winter. And so look at the plant, look at the light needs of that plant in addition to the heat needs of that plant, the warmth of the soil and the warmth of the day. So uh, Paula is back for more. Why don't you get off and go lay down? Good girl. So I know a lot of you are dog lovers as well, but I apologize for the uh, disruption today. Okay, Cal 1699, is it possible to grow a fruit tree in a large container? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of it depends on the fruit tree. Uh, it also greatly depends on how you prune the fruit tree, but absolutely. Fruit trees have been grown in containers for thousands of years. And as long as you prune the tree so that it doesn't get too big and and basically the, the pot or the container that you're growing in can't support the root system of that tree, you can have great success with it. So uh, it, it's it's almost like an espalier. Espalier is, is where you prune a fruit tree into a small size. It's the same basic idea depending on the size of your container and, and the type of tree that you just prune it to stay smaller. And even occasionally, you might need to do some root pruning where you get down and, and trim off some of the roots that are growing so it doesn't get root bound in the pot. But, oh yeah, it's that's absolutely possible. And it's one of those things that you, you'll need to do some research and some learning to uh, get the best success at it. But uh, in in... In my garden, I'm actually planning on doing that. When I get my stone patio built, I'll have some big pots. And in those big pots, I'm planning on growing some fruit bushes and some small trees. So um, you'll see that in the years ahead in videos. But uh, it's it's definitely possible. And actually can be uh, a lot of fun. And so uh, if you, I, I'm growing fruit trees in the ground. And I'm growing fruit trees for espalier. And so it's a natural progression for me to grow fruit trees in containers, in big pots. And uh, I think it just adds to the variety in the garden. Rudimental gardening. Don't delay, friends. Plan your spring, summer garden now and get those seeds ordered. Let's go. I agree. And, and I actually have uh, put my lists together. I'll probably be ordering in this next week or two. But I completely agree. Now's a great time to get your seed orders in and get the plan going. Kind of like the, the question about watering. When should you think about these things? Well, now. As, as the, the season progresses, it becomes later and later to choose the right time to do it. And as I was outside today, I, I realized that we're a week away from the season change. And the days are going to start getting longer for, for me. And planting season gets a day closer every time I wake up. And so act now. I completely agree with your sentiment. Get out there. Get your garden plan. Get your seeds going. And you can be ahead of the game rather than realizing that you forgot something when all your plants are growing. Lance says, raised beds like vegapods and veg trug, would they benefit from a no-dig approach? And so, uh, yes. And so th the idea behind no-dig is to promote the soil life. When you've got a good, healthy soil, especially when you've got all that, that fungal action, all the mycelia moving through the soil, you have all the soil organisms, by digging in the soil, by tilling the soil, you're breaking apart the soil structure and you're disrupting a lot of that soil life. So that's the basic idea. The, the, and you can do that in ground and you can do that in any type of bed system. You can do it in containers. The issue becomes how you keep that soil healthy. And that usually is by or should be by adding organic matter. What often happens as soil gets depleted in a no-dig system 
is you end up having to be reliant on fertilizers because all that organic matter that was downed in the soil has been decomposed. All those nutrients have been used by the plant. And so what you're left with is, is a relatively sterile soil and now the plants won't grow and now you need to add fertilizer. And so even though I try to practice no dig as much as possible, I do think periodically you do need to get some organic matter into the soil. If you've got a very healthy system with the, 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 the beetles and the earthworms, all those soil organisms that can take the material you have on top of the soil and carry it down into the soil, then that lessens the need of having to incorporate that material. But when you have a bed system, especially a bed system that might have a bottom on it, or if you put a weed fabric underneath your bed and you're practicing no dig, now you don't have a lot of that soil life that's going to be incorporating the material on top of the soil into the soil. And that's when you start running into some issues. And so just be aware that you can practice no dig but no dig doesn't necessarily mean zero dig. And so at the time of planting, uh, at, at the time that you're putting some compost on the top of the soil, you might want to uh, be aware of how you're doing it. So one, it's not really a cheat, but one way to get organic matter into the soil of a no dig bed is by transplanting. Grow your plants, grow your peppers, your tomatoes, your peas, whatever it is you're gonna be growing. Start them from seed first, and then put the plant into your no-dig bed. Now, sure, you have to dig a hole to put that plant in, but you're also incorporating all that organic matter that was in the pot, all that organic matter that is around the roots into your bed. And if you keep track of where you plant, over the course of the years, you stagger your planting. So every year, you're basically incorporating new organic matter into your soil through the process of transplanting. And that's kind of the way I approach um, some of my beds, my containers in particular. That's how I incorporate organic matter into the soil in subsequent years is at the time of transplanting, I'll dig a slightly bigger hole, put in some compost, put in the plant. I haven't disrupted the, the overall bed and I've still been able to get some uh, of the organic matter into the bed. Eric is saying, in order to fill our raised beds frugally, we've used leaves, manure, and hay. This is all brown and no green. Can I use nitrogen fertilizer and still plant it in the spring? Uh, you can, I don't think it's, it's necessary. Uh, so, the, the thing when you're using the, the leaves and the branches uh, and the hay, a lot of that's going to be broken down by the, the fungus, the fungal activity in your soil. Uh, there will be some bacterial action. The manure will have some nitrogen to help breaking, break it all down. And the, the issue I have it, with adding nitrogen is like what we talked about before. It's really easy to add too much nitrogen, but you don't necessarily need to think of your soil as a compost pile. In a compost pile, we have our browns and our greens, and if there's too much carbon, we have to add more nitrogen. It really doesn't work the same way within the soil. Within the soil, you can have an abundance of carbon, and the soil life will help take care of it. Uh, do a soil test just to find out how much nitrogen level you have in your soil. And you may find out that when you've added all that organic material, as it breaks down, it will put some nitrogen into your soil. So you may not need fertilizers at all if you've given it enough time to break down. Now, if you just filled your beds and you're going to be planting in two or three months, when things start warming up again, then yeah, that won't be enough time for things to break down and you may need to add fertilizer just to avoid any nitrogen deficiencies that may appear in that bed. That's one reason why I try to do a lot of my amending in the fall 
And I'm using the leaves and the manures and the grass and the straw. And then come springtime, I, it, it's broken down enough. And I'll put some compost on top of the soil, kind of like a no-dig concept, and then put the transplants in and things usually work out pretty good. I really haven't had any issues by using all of those kind of ingredients to, to fill my beds and I'm not using a lot of fertilizer. It, it does balance out. Urban Chicken Mama says, how do you manage slugs? The slug bait disappears when it rains. Homemade tricks like beer in a cup don't work. Thanks. Now, luckily, as dry as I am, because we haven't had any rain in months now, I don't have a, a, a big slug problem. They do appear in spring. Usually like to eat my strawberries if they're going to eat anything. But one of the, the best ways that I've found is a trap. And I agree with you. The bait and a lot of those other things you can buy just don't work as well as, they, as you would like them to. But if you have an area in your garden that is susceptible to slugs, and you probably know where that is because they're eating all those plants, put something like cardboard or five or six sheets of newspaper or an old piece of rug, wet it, put it in the ground or put it on top of the ground where those slugs are appearing and let it sit overnight and then come back the next morning and you should see a whole bunch of slugs underneath all that wet material, underneath that cardboard or newspaper or rug. And then you can just get rid of the slugs. And and that, that means picking them up and killing them. That's how you get rid of the slugs. Trap them and then get rid of them. That's what I've found to be most successful. You, you read things about using copper strips, but there are videos on YouTube of the slugs crawling right across the copper strips. The beer as a trap is okay. You know, it might attract some slugs and and the slugs may tend to go towards that yeast flavor or yeast aroma of the beer, but they're just looking for a nice moist environment to hang out. And so if you give them that that moist cardboard for them to crawl under and hang out, they're going to congregate in that area and it'll make it easier to get rid of at that point. So that's what I've done and that's what I've seen done and it actually works pretty well. Um, Guan is asking, what are your thoughts on bringing bats to the garden? I think it's a great idea. And I'd, I've talked about this in the past. Uh, I am planning on building a bat house in my garden and trying to attract bats. They're fantastic. Now, depending on where you live, bats will serve different purposes. So for most of us, bats are there to eat the, the, the mosquitoes and all those other insects we're trying to get rid of in our garden. In some areas, like in Arizona, for instance, bats will be pollinators of some of the plants that are growing and that bloom at night, which is just fascinating. But bats are fantastic to attract. At the Galileo School Garden, we had a, an Eagle Scout project and the scouts built a bat house in the garden. And I was never there at night, but it looked like we had at least one or two bats that took up residency in the bat house. And they'll they'll come out at night and they'll take care of some of those pests that you might be concerned about. So I think it's a great idea and and it's, it can be a lot of fun. When you do the research and find out about bats and how to build a bat house, it's, it's incredible. You, there's some very specific ways you have to construct the bat house for them to actually reside within it. And I, I, it's, a, it's a great lesson, especially if you've got older kids, that could be a really great project and uh, great lessons for, for, for the kids to build a bat house. Even if the bats don't ever come, it's still a great lesson. So, and it all, it gets back to that, the concept of a balanced ecosystem where where you have the wildlife in your garden and the good animals and good insects will find your garden and help take care of all the bad stuff that might be happening there. And when it gets in balance, it really, I've said this before, in, in that in the fourth year at the school garden, the workload plummeted because we had so few pest problems. Because of all the grasses and the herbs and the flowers, 
all the variety, all of the plants we were growing, we started reaching that equilibrium point after four years. And we just got to enjoy the garden, just the planting and the pruning and the harvesting. We really didn't have to deal with the problems that so many of us have to deal with because we let nature deal with it. And uh, and bats are awesome animals. And so it's definitely something to, to consider. Uh, Echocentric Homestead says, you could have a repeating video for your background. You actually have the dog running around the garden on the show. You know, I, and I've actually played with that a little bit. This software I'm using, um, supports it but as we saw a couple of weeks ago it takes more bandwidth for that to happen and as i was experimenting with it um, i had some buffering issues and i think it's a bandwidth issue in the area that i live in but uh, I, I like that idea and i have actually taken some video and put it on a loop and sat in front of the green screen like i am right now with that intent but uh I think it, it, until I can figure out the bandwidth issue, and right now I, I live outside of town, so it's not as fast as in town. It's one of those issues that we'll just have to wait and see what happens. So Pat is saying, winter sowing spaghetti for the April harvest. Good for you. And if you've seen my video on how to grow spaghetti, uh, you can see that, that you do want to put it in the ground when it's still pretty cold and snowy outside. So. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that you're trying that. Shandy's Garden, how do you correctly space out your fertilizer with nitrogen first, then phosphorus, then potassium signals from the plant? So yeah, the plants will tell you in most situations, it depends on the plant, of course, if they're having a particular deficiency. <clears throat> and so if, if, if you know, and, and the best way to know is with a soil test. If you know your soil is deficient in the primary nutrients, you can look at your plant. And if your plant is stunted and it doesn't have a lot of green growth, that's telling you it needs more nitrogen. The nitrogen is what promotes all of that green new growth. If you're not getting a lot of flower development, if the fruits are small, or you're getting a lot of fruit drop off of your plants, that it could be a phosphorus deficiency. The phosphorus really helps promote the flowers and the fruits and the roots. If the whole garden area, if your plants just aren't healthy, if you're using nitrogen and phosphorus, but it just doesn't seem to do much good, that's where the potassium comes in. The potassium is kind of the regulator that puts the whole system into play. And so the potassium helps manage the plant so that it can use the nutrients and grow and give you everything you're looking for. And you'll see some of that in, in color change of the leaves, particularly if, the, if your leaves are purple as opposed to green. Those are some of the clues that the plant will give you that it's having a deficiency. One of the best ways to deal with this is to use a balanced fertilizer. And so that's why so often you see fertilizers that are a 10, 10, 10, or a 12, 12, 12, or a 15, 15, 15. That's a balance of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. And that is often the easiest way to figure out the, the proper spacing out of the fertilizer. Now the nitrogen is going to be used up the quickest Nitrogen is also going to leach out of the soil the quickest. You can expect that the phosphorus is going to pretty much hit the soil and stay in the same spot wherever it resides. The potassium could potentially leach out over time. And so in most cases, once you apply a balanced fertilizer, you really don't need to add much more phosphorus. You do need to focus on the nitrogen and possibly later in the season do a, a second feeding. And so go to, and then here's a great lesson for, for research. Go to a nursery, go to a garden center, and start looking at how the, the fertilizer bags are labeled. So you'll see a, a, a vegetable garden fertilizer that will be a 10, 10, 10. 
And then you'll see a bag of tomato fertilizer that is going to be lower on the nitrogen because you don't want a lot of new leafy growth on tomatoes. You want all that, that fruit production. And so you might see a tomato bag of fertilizer that would be something like a 10, 15, 18. You're going to have a low nitrogen, but you're going to have a higher phosphorus and potassium number. And, and that's, that's the, the way that a lot of the manufacturers sell the fertilizers as a tomato fertilizer or whatever plant they're targeting is they anticipate what the plant needs. That's another way to approach the timing is to look at the back of these bags or boxes of fertilizer and they'll give you an indication of when to apply them. I think a, a better answer is to amend your soil early and often so that the soil is healthy enough that the plant isn't going to tell you it needs nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium or calcium or any of the other issues that might arise because the soil has all of those nutrients already in it because of the activity that you took to prepare your soil. So <clears throat> correctly spacing out the fertilizer varies by plant, varies on what your soil has available, and varies by the actual amount of fertilizer that the, the plant actually needs and, and where that deficiency falls. So it, it's not a, a quick, easy um, hip pocket kind of answer. It is one of those things that you do need to do a little more research and hopefully come up with what works best for you and your plants. Uh, so thanks, Jay. I'll, I'll pass that on to Mala. Uh, it's, it's been four days, and so I need to give her a couple more days with the cone, but she's getting antsy and wants to get out there. So I appreciate your sentiment. I think tomorrow I may experiment and take the, to the cone off her for a while. I just, uh, while I'm in here and I didn't know where she would be, yes, the cone of shame had to play its role this morning. But she's just got so much energy and is being hindered by all of that. Shandy says, I got very lacy eaten leaves on my Romanesco broccoli. I'm leaving them out in 6B. Will they still grow first time trying it? So back, this gets back to what I was saying earlier about the lights. Um, they, they, will, they will stay alive. They should stay alive in 6B until it gets really cold, but you probably aren't gonna see any more growth for a couple more months. Uh, it, there's just not enough light for the broccoli to grow. So leave them in the ground to harvest uh, for as long as you can, but don't expect any new growth of the broccoli heads until we start getting more sunlight and the plants start recovering again. And then you can, you can have that harvest. You can keep them alive um, by covering them with hoops and plastic, depending on how cold it gets. And then when the sun starts getting higher in the sky and the days get longer, you'll start seeing some of that new growth, but don't expect to see it anytime uh, in the near future. In 4B1K1 is saying, I've been raising Coternix quail for two years now. That's awesome. I think that's a, that's a nice project. I keep them on my fallow beds during the winter instead of mulching. I've never mulched. That is a big mistake. Is this a decent substitute? So it's not a substitute. Um, but it, it's a it's a nice idea. I really like the idea of of giving your garden to the quail during the 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 months of winter. I think it's a great idea. But you should also be uh, mulching. Mulch has a lot of different benefits, and so the quail can help deal with the weed issue. The quail can actually help by adding some nutrients to the soil through their droppings, but there, there are other issues like sun damage to your soil and the moisture levels within your soil and just adding more organic matter to your soil. So I would go ahead and do both. Go ahead and apply some crushed leaves, some straw and the quail. They're probably going to tear up a lot of that mulch and you're probably going to have to re-mulch some of those beds. Uh, but I think that's, a, that's an interesting idea to uh, actually do that. They, if you have chickens, you can do the same thing with chickens. 
Um, chickens are going to be a lot more destructive. Uh, but particularly in the springtime, and this is when my neighbor's chickens kept jumping the fence this last year, and this was a good indication for me that my beds were waking up because the chickens were digging out the mulch because underneath the mulch, the beetle larva was waking up. And so this could be a way for you to, to, to identify when your beds are getting ready and your soil is warming up is have some mulch. And the more that the quail start digging into that mulch uh, in the springtime, that may give you some indication that your soil is waking up. Uh, so as a substitute for mulch, I, I wouldn't say it's a substitute. I would say it, it's a nice extra. But uh, can, but do do mulch. Mulch is just one of those things that uh, is nice to have for, for so many reasons. Gary's saying, do I need to trim off pepper leaves as they grow when I overwinter them inside? I did cut off all the leaves before bringing them in, but they're growing back. And so if you're overwintering your peppers in a cool area, like we were talking about earlier, uh, it, with the, the, the berry bushes. If you keep them in a cool area, they'll approach a dormancy and you won't need to even be concerned about the leaves. But as soon as they start growing more leaves, that's telling me that, that they're happy and they're in a warm area and they want to grow. So I would just go ahead and let them grow because what's happening when they're putting out those new leaves is they're taking the energy that they have stored in the roots to grow those new leaves. And so if you trim off those pepper leaves, they, they're gonna grow more pepper leaves. And eventually you're gonna deplete a lot of that energy that's stored in the roots. So now when you put it outside, you're gonna wonder why you're not getting any new leaves. Well, it's because the roots are played out. So go ahead and let some of the leaves grow put them under lights, put them near a window so they can get some sunlight for so for photosynthesis to replace some of that nutrient loss that's coming from the roots. Um, but you can limit the number of leaves that are growing. I wouldn't I wouldn't cut them all off. I wouldn't trim the entire plant. You can uh, reduce the number of leaves you have. But once the new growth starts happening, you almost kind of have to let that new growth happen. And you may consider putting it into a bigger pot under lights and just let the plant grow and then put it outside as soon as you can. You, you might have a big robust plant by then, by then. But one of the ideas behind overwintering is to try to reduce that new growth as much as possible with the cool conditions. And uh, at this point, I think you've got some happy pepper plants that are telling you they want to keep growing. <clears throat> Brian's saying, any suggestions on a heat-tolerant broccoli? My calabrese broccoli bolted immediately this spring. I had the same problem with that same. I grew some calabrese broccoli, and it bolted right away. Um, <clears throat> I, there are some varieties. There's one I was just looking at. I don't remember the variety, but as, as you go through the seed catalogs, as you go to, through online seed sources, Look for that in the description. I, I don't have one that's on the, the the tip of my tongue right now, but there are all kinds of plants, not just broccolis. There are all kinds of plants that are slow bolting. In fact, there's actually a spinach I grow that is uh, a slow bolting uh, spinach. That's actually in the name of the plant. And so you can you can find different plants that are slow to bolt. You will have to, to look for them. They might be a hybrid. You might not be able to find an heirloom variety that you can save the seeds from, uh, but they are out there. I, I just apologize. I don't have one. If someone else has one, you can definitely put it in the comments as I scroll through. Uh, Mr. Graham is saying, um, do you, uh, do I have, I'm not sure I asked the question, I understand the question. I think there's a word missing about the Asian pear trees that would work in a Belgian fence. Um, and so Belgian fence, great question. And I'm actually um, in off to the side, uh, other way, this way. Uh, I'm actually planning on doing a Belgian fence. And I've been debating whether to do that with pear trees or apple trees. And so a Belgian fence is a type of espalier. It's a pruning method of, 
uh, fruit trees where you basically prune the tree to be in a V shape. And then you take another tree and grow it close to it and have it as a V shape. And the trees create a fence as they grow side by side and you have multiple um, trees. So if you're asking, can you use Asian pear trees on a be Belgian fence? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, apple trees tend to work better and there are certain pear varieties that work better than others. And so I wouldn't necessarily say that all Asian pear trees would work for that. You would need to find out specifically how the tree grows and how it fruits. The, the big issue whenever you're doing a Belgian fence or an es espalier method, or you're doing some heavy pruning, is you have to understand how the tree bears fruit. And so like an apple tree, an apple tree will actually grow these very small branches. And it's on those small branches that the fruit develops. It doesn't develop on the big long branches. And the, br the long branches just act as a structure for those little fruiting spurs for the fruit to develop. And so you can prune apple trees dramatically as long as you leave behind those fruiting spurs. And so you get a lot of plant uh, trees that don't work as well in an espalier, like cherry trees, for instance, because the cherries are growing on the branches as opposed to the, the short spurs. And so if you're pruning off the branches of the cherry tree to fit a small shape like an espalier, you might be cutting off the branches that are going to be growing your cherries. Same kind of idea with pears. You have to, to look at the different types of pears and fully understand just exactly how they fruit when you choose the, the, the pear. But a Belgian fence typically has more or, or longer branches and the, the trees growing close together. And so uh, I, I'm, I think Asian pears should do okay as long as you pick a good variety for your area. Uh, okay, let's see what else. Um, Old Fart Gardener says, I got all my seeds for next year except rutabaga, which I've never grown before. I grew rutabagas a few years ago. It takes a long time. Make sure your soil is nice and loose and rich because it's going to take up a nice long space. But when you dig up that big rutabaga root, uh, it's actually pretty cool. So I've only grown them a couple times at the school. And uh, I, I don't have them on my list yet for this year. But I was thinking about putting some rutabagas in. I was actually thinking about doing rutabagas and parsnips as a cover crop to help break apart some of this soil. So if you saw my video recently, this is where I put all of those leaves uh, where I'm going to be creating soil. And so in that area, I'm thinking about growing some of those big rooted plants to help break apart that compacted soil that I have underneath all of those uh, leaves and pine needles and chicken manure and everything else that I stacked in that area. So um, thank you for reminding me that I probably need to add rutabagas to my list. And so I wanted to go ahead and, and show you this picture today. I took this picture just after sunrise. And so this is my garden early in the morning. And I think getting out into your garden at any time of day can be educational. But we often stop going out to our garden in winter, and especially early in the morning when it's cold. And it was below freezing when I was out there. But it it's really a nice way to get a look at your garden with the bare bones of your garden. In winter, in the morning, you really can see your garden from a completely different perspective and get ideas for where you might want to put new plants. And you walk around and you start thinking about what your garden is lacking because when it's growing and you see all the green growth and the trees and the, the flowers and everything is, is, is exactly the way you want it, you get a different perception of your garden. You see what your garden has and that's what we all like to see what our garden has to offer us but when you go out on a winter's morning you can really get a good understanding of what your garden doesn't have 
And so that's why I wanted to show this today is just to, to, to broach that subject, that when your garden looks barren, when your garden is not growing, can really be a good time to get out and figure out what you should be growing in your garden. And so I've been doing this every day for a long time now. Uh, and we'll come in and make notes as I think about, oh, there's a bare spot that I didn't notice when the plants were growing. I need to put a flower there, or I need to put a berry bush there, or I need to, to do something with that space. You can see the space when there's nothing growing after all the leaves have fallen off. So uh, this is my garden today, and by all means, yeah, send me your pictures to Gardener Scott at gardenerscott.com, and uh, I'd love to show them in the background to see what else is going on. Uh, okay, let's see. Gar Karen says, I made it. thought I didn't have aphids on my pepper plants. I brought in, watched a guy taking off all the soil off and submerging in soaping water and changed the soil infestation. Awesome. And, and that's, that's uh, again, get out there and find the information because... Just dousing or, or soaking your plant, burying your plant upside down and just putting it in a bucket of water, that's often enough to, to deal with some of those those pests. So good. I'm glad you were able to, to deal with that. Urban Chicken Mom is saying, how do I tell which strawberry plants are the old ones that need to go because they're not going to produce much anymore? They multiply so much. Look at the crown. Look at the, the center of the plant. And so a young plant is pretty much going to be all leaves. You look at the plant and you're going to see the center of the strawberry plant and the leaves coming out from the center. And then the runners will come out from just beyond where those leaves are coming from. As the plant ages, the strawberry plant, that crown becomes woodier and bigger. And so in the second year, when you look at the crown of the plant, it's going to be kind of kind of big and woody. It's going to start looking gnarly. You're still going to have the runners. You're still going to have the leaves. The plant itself is going to be much bigger. And the center of that plant is going to be noticeably changed. And then in the third year, the year that, that I'd usually suggest you start thinking about changing out your plants, that crown is noticeably different. It may even have split into multiple crowns and it's going to be woody. It's going to be knobby. It's, it's going to be much bigger and the whole plant is probably going to be bigger. The leaves will probably be bigger. So the, the strawberry plant will tell you as it ages because it ages through from the center out. And that's how you could be looking. And when you dig it up, you'll notice that the, the roots uh, are, are going to be pretty well established, but you'll notice those older plants that you dig up are going to be really woody and uh, not not the the young, spry, slender plants that you, you might get used to in your first year. Okay, getting close to time. Time flies when you don't have a dog that's nipping at your elbow. <clears throat> so I think she's taking a nap right now. Okay, let's see as we scroll down. So as I scroll, I'm looking for like Mayday Garden that said at Gardener Scott. And that, that helps prompt me to know that you're asking a question. My raised beds are going on their second year and the soil dropped by half. Uh, I had the same thing. So the, the video I shot two years ago when I filled my raised beds, <clears throat> I used a lot of branches and stems and logs. And last year... I measured a five inch drop in the level of that soil. And at the end of this year, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. So at the beginning of this year, I amended that bed with a lot more compost and organic matter. And now at the end of this season, I, I've noticed that it's dropped about another three inches. And so over the course of about two years, depending on how you measure it, that one bed has lost at least eight inches. And that's because all that organic matter has decomposed. The volume has been lost. 
As it decomposes, those nutrients are released and the plants absorb those nutrients. The soil organisms might be multiplying, but all that organic matter disappears. That's why you need to add more organic matter to your soil. If you practice no dig, you can just put compost on top of the soil. And as long as the soil life is active, it will incorporate that material. And so when you see like Charles Dowding's method of no dig gardening, very rich beds. And so his soil level effectively is dropping about two inches per year, which is why he adds about two inches of compost per year. Well, until you figure out what that level is. So like in my case, I was using relatively poor soil, using a lot of organic matter and really trying to entice the soil organisms by giving them a perfect environment. And I saw huge drops. And that's probably what you're seeing as well, is you've got a lot of good organic matter, good soil life. It's eating all that organic matter and your soil level is dropping. Well, you're probably going, you said soil level dropped by half. You're probably going to need to add at least that much back in. Do consider adding some more of the actual native soil that'll help keep the structure in place. But until you can reach that point where your soil level is dropping by two inches a year, so you only need to add two inches a year, you may need to add more. It, it, you may need to add more compost and more organic matter than you ever thought you needed. And the indication is because your soil level is dropping. So use that as a clue and just keep adding the organics. It tells me that you're doing a lot of things right and keep doing those things right because the soil organisms are eating all the food that you're giving them. Okay, <clears throat> moving right along and now we're getting close to the end. It's so good to see all the activity going back and forth today. I know some of these questions have been from a little while ago and so I'm going back into the past and trying to catch up with the present. Um, Eric says, I plan on replacing my lawn in the next couple of weeks. I don't have budget for turf, so I'm planning on prepping the soil and doing seeds. Do you have any videos that I can, can help with the task? So yes, um, and, and I have another one coming. So I have a video that I did, I think this last year, and I think the title of the video, and I'm sure Jay will be right on top of this, is why I don't have a lawn. And so in that video, I talk about this exactly. I got, a, I got rid of my lawn and put in a landscape with, with some terraced walls and lots of perennial flowers. And in that video, I talk about the concept of taking cardboard and putting cardboard over whatever you have, your lawn, in my case, it's a lot of weeds, and then putting some soil or putting mulch on top of that cardboard. The cardboard is going to, to smother and kill all the plants underneath. The mulch and whatever soil you can add to the top will add organic matter and a growing environment for the plants. And then you grow in that area. And so depending on how good or bad the soil is, many of us that have lawns, the soil underneath the lawn is terrible. So you may need to go a season just focused on trying to build up the soil, adding all of those crushed leaves and any other organic matter you can to the top to help break down and improve the, the soil that's on top of the cardboard. The cardboard will break down too, which will also help enrich that area. And then you plant in it. And so I, I still have a pretty large area. That's what the video is that's coming. And I still have a lot of compo or a lot of uh, cardboard. And so this next video in a few months will show me doing that, putting the cardboard down, putting some soil down, putting some wood chips in, in this case because it's a landscape with some perennial plants. Um, but then I'll be putting in the, the plants and some of that will be seeds. I did that with sunflower seeds this year and grew sunflower seeds through the, the cardboard, just dug a little hole in the cardboard, put a sunflower seed in, mulched on top of it, and started growing sunflowers on the back side of what you'll see in that video. So check out that video, Why I Don't Have a Lawn, and that may give you some ideas 
and then look for that video coming in a couple months and um, hopefully that'll be something that um, will be beneficial for you I, I think lawns have a purpose for some people but in an area like mine where we haven't had any precipitation since August it doesn't make a lot of sense none of my neighbors have lawns um, my neighbor on the back side here does have a couple small areas just because they like to sit out on a grassy area but very small but none of none of my other neighbors have lawns and I show that in that video I just live in a really dry area water is relatively expensive and so we have to choose a, a landscape that doesn't take a lot of water lawns take a lot of water so I don't have a lawn and so depending on your <coughs> purpose for doing that do look at the plants and the seeds that will do best for you. Native plants ideally are, are the best when you replace a lawn because it cuts down on the maintenance dramatically and can definitely um, improve your landscape because you get to choose everything that goes into it. Okay, um, so I wanted to, to end with today <coughs> something that you actually saw earlier. And so when I did the video about all, putting in all these leaves and everything, you saw Mala there. She was at my feet. When I would start digging a hole, she'd be right there a second later trying to dig the same hole, running all through the leaves. And it was disruptive and became a little frustrating. And and, and I had to stop because I realized, and 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 this is this is the, the moment I wanted to share with you, that you really need to accept frustration when it comes to gardening. Now I know that's that's really nothing new because gardening as hobbies go is about as frustrating a choice as anything because rarely do things go right all the time. But as I was was playing with Mala, trying to wear her out a little bit so that I could finish the filming, it took me back to all those other years, all those other dogs I had in the garden who were frustrating. They dug holes, they pulled up plants, Mala's still finding carrots that I didn't harvest and bringing them into the house. And those are the kind of things that I remember. I don't, I don't remember a lot of those events in a bad way. I, I don't remember them as, as frustrating to the point that it, make, that it made it unpleasant. Instead, I look back, and particularly with, with the pets I had in the garden, with fond memories. But then beyond just the animal aspect, as we look at the pests and the aphids and everything else that becomes so frustrating in the garden, well, ju just like we just pointed out, you know, suddenly when you find that thing that works and you, you dump your plant into a basin of water to get rid of the aphids and the aphids are gone, the frustration just disappears. The frustration dissipates and now you focus on the success and so it's so easy to get frustrated throughout this whole gardening journey to the point that you just aren't enjoying the day when you find yourself at that point of frustration things aren't going right you're not having a good day the the birds have eaten all your fruit the i've told the story of the the apricot tree that i grew at a previous house Apricots don't do well in this area of Colorado, but I had five apricots on that tree and I was so happy and I went out and I squished the, the fruit and I thought tomorrow is going to be perfect for harvesting these apricots and I came back the next morning to harvest and all the apricots had been eaten by the birds. I had none. It took me three years to get five and I ended up with nothing I had to wait a whole nother year and the next year we had an early freeze and didn't get any at all well that was extremely frustrating but it actually taught me an extremely important lesson that I've talked about in the past which is the animals know when your fruit is ripe and so don't wait until tomorrow act now and at any point in the garden you're thinking about harvesting, but thinking that tomorrow will be the best day to harvest, well, don't wait till tomorrow. Do it today. 
that came about, that, that way that I now garden came about because of an extremely frustrating event after a year of anticipation. Well, now I just garden differently. And I don't look back on that as a bad event. I'm glad to share it. And it was a very important lesson to learn. So don't let yourself get down. Don't, don't allow yourself to, to just point out to yourself those things that went wrong. Look at those things, but learn from them and stick them into that part of your brain for the happy memories and the pleasant thoughts as opposed to just letting the frustrations overrun yourself. And so, you know, earlier the idea of getting your seeds now is a good one because that can become frustrating. As you move through your planning, as you move through the preparation for your spring garden, now all of a sudden you're behind and it becomes frustrating. Oh, I should have ordered my seeds a month ago. Oh, I should have figured out what I was going to do. Eh, don't worry about it. It's going to be frustrating, but don't let that eat at you to the point that it becomes disabling or uncomfortable. Just accept it. And when you've got a dog that's, that's frustrating your actions, realize that it could be worse. Maybe you don't have a dog, you still have frustrations, and you don't have someone to share your gardening time with like I do with Mala. So Mala is a handful. She's like having a child again. She is frustrating, but it's a blast to be out in the garden and watch all of her antics and everything that she's doing. So embrace all that that can offer you and just maybe shift the way you look at things a little bit and suddenly it becomes a lot more enjoyable. Well, I look forward to seeing you here next Monday where we do this all over again. Thank you so much for all of the activity, all the comments, everything else that was taking place on this forum today. And I hope you have a great gardening week ahead. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.